family. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I guess I can't go. Yeah. So welcome. Back. So welcome back to the second part. Thanks to Stephen. You have done a great job in stimulating discussions over the coffee break. I certainly oh. learned a lot about why three things, why ACTC, so lots of good discussions. So I guess you'll continue about it. So okay, please. great. Thanks. So uh, just recap, right? So we, we are interested in this three-phase AC system and the three concepts, uh, key ideas that allow us to do per phase analysis. That's the bottom line. All right. Uh, so I, uh, I'll go through the device models and then use that to model the net. Okay, sorry. Okay, so, and then we use that to model the network and the power flow equations, then we can do uh, the math that, that we usually see in research papers. Okay, so I will try to go through this quickly, and if we don't have enough time, I'm gonna skip some, some parts of that. So transmission line. Right? So these are the important devices, and there are more devices, uh, but transmission line, one that proposes. So, what we would like is eventually get to this circuit model of transmission line. So this is a standard model for trans circuit model for transmission line. It's called a pi model. So this looks like a pi. <laughs> so there's a series impedance. Uh, that's the shunt emittance on, at each end. Uh, what this represents is the terminal behavior, the uh, relationship between the sending end voltage and current and receiving end voltage and current. So if you think about you have a generator here to try to transmit power through a transmission line. Eventually, uh, the power will arrive at the low, so you connect the low. So typically, <coughs> you specify how much power you need at the low and at what voltage level. So you specify V2, for example. Right? Uh, the power, if you specify the complex power, you also specify the I, I2. So Think of, we know V2, I2, and we want to design what will be the voltage and the current that we require to supply that kind of load. And therefore, we need a map that maps the receiving end uh, variables to the sending end variables. Right? So this will be a circuit model for the transmission line. The next 10 minutes or so, I'll just go through uh, how, how do we derive this? So it certainly depends on the material of the line, the size of the line, how we arrange the line, for example, uh, and then, and then uh, get to this, and then some implications of such a model, for example. Okay. So uh, think of, we have, say, three wires, three conductors that are coming out of the board. Right? So the current flows, these electromagnetic effects, the um, Total flux linkage uh, for if there's only one line uh, is related to the currents in the line. Uh, it's proportional current, and this proportionality constant is what we call inductance. If we have multiple lines, then the uh, total flux linkage corresponding to this uh, line, uh, case line, right, that would define the characteristics of this line, is given by this expression. So never mind the detail. What it breaks down is that there is a factor that depends on the current in the case conductor. And then there are a bunch of uh, electromagnetic effects due to currents at the other conductors. And the dependence is the first, the self-inductance depends on the radius of, of this conductor. So there's our prime, which is radius times a factor. Think of that as one. And then uh, the mutual inductance from other conductors carrying current depends on the distance between the centers of these two conductors. So that's that. Now if we, if we carefully design how we build these lines, for example, if we use the same material for each of the three, if they have the same radius, if the distance are the same, the separations between each pair is the same, then that expression boils down to this. Now what is nice about this is that the phases are decoupled. That the uh, total flux uh, linkages in phase A, meaning say this, this line, depends only on the currents in phase A. It's not that there's no mutual interactions among those wires. There are. But because of this symmetry, 
the interest will reduce boils down to this very simple term, law of D, which is the same for all phases. And therefore, it is as if the phases decouple. So that's the point. Now, there's one key assumption in this derivation, which is if you look at the current, so this direction, some of them are positives on the y, uh, negatives and so on. The currents across the conductance, the sum, is zero at all time. And therefore, if, let's say, the, the power that you, um, uh, the wires are used to carry the power to the low and the return follow the same path, for example, then this is satisfied. And therefore, we have uh, decoupled phases. So again, that allows us to do per phase analysis. Uh, similarly, if you look at the capacitance of each line, which is defined to be, so the charge is proportional to the voltage, uh, and that constant is the capacitance. <coughs> you work out the physics, again, it boils down to the, the voltage depends not only on the charge in the case conductor, right, this one, it also depends on char charges at the other conductors. And it de that dependence is uh, in terms of the distance between the conductors. And again, if you carefully design your wire like we did before, and under the assumption that the charge is all sum to zero, then the phases decouple. Right? So the voltage in the case conductor depends only on the charge uh, in the case conductor. So, and therefore, the, the, the mutual interaction uh, has a very simple structure. And they're all the same. OK, so this defines, so in summary, uh, if we have this balanced three phase line, then the phases are decoupled under those assumptions that are reasonable, right? The, the return paths are follow the same uh, as the forward path, for example. Then the line is characterized by this series impedance, where L is what we saw before, the inductance per meter. C is the capacitance per meter. And there's this thing due to resistance or, or conductance. That depends on the material, depends on the size of the uh, uh, area of, of your wires and so on. So each line then is classified by these two numbers, series impedance and shunt emittance per meter. Right? So we know what the material is when we build the line, we know how we arrange them, and therefore we know these two numbers. Okay, so the, the uh, right, okay. Then let's use this line characteristic to build a circuit model for the transmission line. Right. No question. Right? OK. So uh, what we're interested in is the terminal behavior. That is, if we specify the voltage and currents or power at the low end, what is the voltage and currents or the powers that we need on the supply? Right. So we need to map V2, I2. So when we apply a voltage, so this is the per phase. Uh, we will do all this per phase business. And at the end, we get a model that is per phase model. This is the voltage to neutral. Right? Remember the per, per phase uh, circuit that we have? So that's that voltage. Okay? So when we apply a voltage V1 on the supply side, which will drive a current, what we receive here uh, is, is no longer V1 because of the impedance, series impedance, the voltage will typically drop. Uh, the currents may typically leak. So, and therefore, the voltage and current at each point in the line uh, is different, are different. So, but, you, but you can uh, use this Kirchhoff law to figure out what, the, what it is. All right, so suppose, so you measure this is 0, and then across, uh, this is x. So at position x, right, you have a certain voltage, you have a certain current. Now, we know this um, uh, series impedance uh, per meter, per unit length. And therefore, you can think of this infinitesimal segment of your wire uh, to have a series impedance z times dx and uh, the strong emittance y times dx. And again, z and y are the things that we know from the previous slide. So we build the wire stuff, we know them. And then you can do this. Uh, uh, so we're interested in this map, right? So you can, you can, you can write down uh, a differential. Oops. You can write down a differential equation that, that relates V and I with respect to the position. Solve that. You get something like this. Details are not important. The point is, 
once we build a line, we know the shunt uh, emittance, uh, we know the series impedance that defines these two parameters. This is called characteristic impedance of the line, but, but some parameter, propagation constant, some parameter. Then these two parameters defines a linear map that maps the receiving end voltage and current to the sending end. Right? And therefore, we build a network, we know this matrix. We know how a transmission line behaves end to end. Yes? What is the impedance? Right, OK. So um, uh, think of this as, um, uh, say, like a resistance. Then if you apply a current, so the so resistance is a device with two wires. You apply a current, uh, you apply a voltage, then there's a current goes through it. The effect is the current will heat up the stuff, so that, that consumes uh, energy. Now, if it is transmission line, that energy that's being consumed is bad. It's a loss. But if it is a uh, light bulb, the traditional light bulb, that heat is good because it's, well, heat is a loss, but it also gives out light. And if the low consumes energy, so the impedance, you can think of, uh, think of this, uh, the simplest thing is, is the resistance. Even though for transmission lines, uh, typically <laughs> resistance is very, very small. There's more inductance. And anyway, that answers the question. Uh, so, yes. So th this, is, this is for low frequency. There's no radi radiative uh, component to this analysis. Right? So if you're thinking about electromagnetic, so it depends on the model that you use. You can go back to the Maxwell equations. But then you, but not you this, get, not this well, you can think of this as an approximation of that very detailed model, for example. So this is a model that is reasonable for, say, understanding steady state of a power system. But I guess maybe to, to you the key thing is that um, when we apply, when we, when we connect generator to a transmission network eventually to the low, right? So the point of the network is to carry energy from that point to that point. When you go through a network, say one transmission line, there will be some energy loss. Uh, there's a relation between the power that you send or the voltage and currents on the sending end and the power received or the voltage and current at receiving end. And the relationship between what we receive at a low, so we, this is what we want, we typically specify this. And what we need to supply on the other end has a very simple linear map in terms of voltage and current. And that map depends on characteristics of your line that's defined by this impedance and stuff. So mathematically, a transmission line is a linear map. Okay. So, okay, so this is the model that maps uh, V2 to V1. You can think of this model as a circuit like this. So, which, which means that um, there's, so this is a circuit diagram, slightly different from what's been previous. But uh, it's, you, can, you could replace it by some other, but, but the typical thing you can think of that matrix as represented by this circuit, where there's a uh, series impedance, there's some emittance at each end. For those who, who, who don't know circuit analysis, it doesn't matter. It, all it is is some linear map. For those who, who know the circuit model, then, then you can do this uh, circuit analysis. If you write down the Kirchhoff law, uh, then you can relay, you can relay again, this V2I2 to uh, V1I1 in a matrix, linear map. So then you match this matrix from the circuit analysis with this matrix. Then, then you can write down the parameters of your circuit model, where Z prime is Z times a factor, Y prime is Y times a factor. What is Z and Y? It's simply the total impedance that depends on the characteristics of a line, impedance per meter, times the length. 
and the total emittance is again the sum of total uh, the sum of emittance times the length. Can you can you explain your symbols real quickly? Uh, uh, which symbol? <laughs> All of them. All of them. Yeah. All of them. Okay. The so. Yeah. Okay, so for example, the um, remember it, it goes all the way back to this. <coughs> it goes all the way back to to this. So the characteristic of your line, which depends on the materials and size and all of that, is characterized by, characterized by these two parameters. It has a resistance, it has an inductance. Typically for high voltage transmission lines and all that, this is very small because this is going to determine how much energy is lost in your transmission network. And therefore, you build your system so that this is small. But there's two, two numbers. And there's a strong emittance where you can think of current's least, right? As you, as you send power from one end to the other, then the current that least is determined is, is due to this, uh, this, this thing that we call strong emittance. That also has a, think of this like one over the resistance. Uh, and then it's, it's the capacitance effect. So in that circuit model that, uh, that you see, there's four things, R and L, this G and C, are this stuff, are the, uh, are the, uh, the symbols that, so this is R and I don't know whether that's your question. This resistor in like uh, in a load, right? Oh, no. no, the load will be here. Okay. You connect the load here. But this is but this models the effect of transmission line when you send power from, say, generation to the load. And to repeat, just because you said the transmission line, which I think of as a linear map, linear meaning from voltage. Voltage current to voltage current. So if we think of it as power, then it's non-linear. Quadratic or not? Quadratic. We will come back to these powerful equations. So now we're still trying to model this device transmission line. But we eventually will come to the powerful equations that models the networks and so on. This is a model of a single transmission line? A single transmission line, yes. It's called a pi model because of this thing, this shape. Okay, so, so again, Z and Y are, are the, the stuff that depends on the material and the length, L is the length. Okay. And, and these things are some factor, okay. So if you have a really long transmission line, then the, the pi model has, has that, which, which, is, which is this, okay. But if the line is shorter, then this is roughly one. And therefore, all matters is the length of the line. So, so this, this becomes one, roughly. Uh, if you still short a line, you can ignore this. You can assume this is zero. Then you get this. So we saw this diagram before. The transmission line, just some serious impedance. And sometimes we even assume the resistance in the series impedance is zero, so it's just an inductive. But, but those are the assumptions eventually get to some model that we use in power flow. So this is just a model of transmission line as impedance. Okay. Uh, right, so this is, so, so basically if you specify this is the power that you need um, in this simple example, for example, that will specify the current that I need. And the loss uh, in the transmission line. So, so the, you can think of the heat loss here is good, it is, is what we use. Heat loss here is bad. This is just to bring power from here to here. And that heat loss is, is uh, proportional to the current squared, current magnitude squared. And this is the resistance of the line. And therefore, if we want to minimize this, we have to minimize the I, we will use a very high voltage. That's why the, in the transmission line uh, network voltages are so high. But again, there's a cause in high voltage and all of that. That's why eventually we, we come down to, to low voltage. 
Okay. So the recap, um, the line characteristic depends on how we build the system. There's a linear per phase circuit model. That's, that's the bottom line. Eventually, we come down to a linear circuit per phase model that we use for balance system. Right? It, it looks like something like this. Okay. Uh, transformer. So transformer is an important device because you see all these different voltages in the network. That is where we need the transformers to change the voltage levels. And that is also why ACs uh, have been the dominant compared with DC. Uh, it's easy to change voltage levels. So the, the ideal transformer is characterized by just one number. Is the, okay, so, the, so, so, so physically this is basically two magnetic uh, uh, core and then you have wires around them. And, then, um, and the, the, the number of coils in each, uh, the primary and secondary side de determines uh, this parameter N. Number, number of, uh, uh, and, and that defines the map between uh, the, the primary side so from the left and the secondary side. So, so N is the ratio of the number of coils. A is just one over that. Simple. This, okay. You can look at the power. Because it's ideal, there's no loss. So the power input and output is the same. What you put in, right? Now, the non-ideal, then there's some serious um, impedance, there's some, some emittance. Uh, and therefore, a non-ideal transformer, or at least a model of it, is characterized by these three numbers. How the voltage goes from primary to the secondary, and then uh, this, this serious impedance and some emittance. And these two you can measure. You build a device, you do some measurement, you know N, you know this, you know this, and therefore you know the characteristic of your transformer. This is one phase. Now three phase, uh, you, right, again, uh, you can write down a map between, say, the sending end, the receiving end, voltage and current. This is a linear map. So a transformer is a linear device. Uh, three phase, so you have, so this is one phase, right? So this is one phase. You, you have these coils and stuff. You have single phase transformer, three of them. You can connect them in some clever way. So this particular connection corresponds to a Y connection of transformers on the primary side. On the secondary side, which is these coils, the way you connect them is a Y configuration, three phase. Uh, you, know, you can do delta delta, you can do delta y, you can do y delta. This is particularly interesting because you get a boost. So, for example, the tr transformer is typically used uh, use for many, 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 many purposes. But one of them is to just step up, the step up your voltage. Uh, you get a boost of, because of the arrangement, you get a boost of square root 3 for free. So that's, so that's useful. And then you could have, you could have a y delta. Okay, so, the, so in general, for ideal transformer, um, three phase, depending on how you connect them, right? If you say Y, Y, then the voltage gain is N. Okay, N is the ratio of primary to secondary core, number of cores. Right. The current is one over N. And therefore, because the ideal power gain is one. If you connect them in delta, delta, the, the gain is also N. If you connect in delta y, then it is not n. You have a square root 3 boost, and then you add 30 degree. So it's a complex gain. What is gain again? Ah, OK. Factor? Right, so the, the gain is the, um, v, uh, the, v, the, the voltage. Uh, so this is the, uh, the, the voltage on, on the um, Secondary sound, this end, is this gain times the voltage input. So you apply an input voltage, <coughs> the output will be multiplied by this. The multiplicative factor. Yes, multiplicative factor. That's right. And the current is one minus that. But it's complex number in general, depending on the con how you c connect them. So it's one, min one over the complex conjugate. So the power is, uh, the power gain is the product of these two gains. Because power is V times I. So if I increase voltage by 10 times, 
but current is reduced by 10 times, the car power is 1. Power gain is 1. So for real transformers, so they must lose some power. So what, you know, how, how far away or how close is the power gain to 1 for a real transformer? For real, I, I don't know the number. Uh, but typically, it's relatively close. I guess it also depends on how big and right. If you build a big one, then you want to use materials and everything so that it's small and so on. So empirically, uh, if it's wide delta, then you get a score of three step down. Okay. So again, this, this is interesting for um, step up purpose because of square root three. And therefore, a perfect equivalent circular transformer is simply you have this um, non-ideal transformer uh, effect, right? So that's what you were asking. And then you have this ideal transformer that's defined by this in general complex scale. And again, the voltage and currents is related to uh, the voltage currents at the, other, the output end, secondary side, by a linear map. It depends on the, um, uh, the, the ideal transformers gain and uh, these this, uh, this non-ideal effects of the real transformer. Okay. So again, you get a perfect model, linear model. You can do perfect analysis in a power network that has transformers. So there's one thing that I don't tell you is that you can do this per unit normalization stuff and then most transformers disappear from your circuit. Never mind. Uh, so, so the recap, you can, for three phase trans, um, balance system, you could have different configurations. Uh, you still just get a linear per phase circuit model that looks like this. Okay. So I'm gonna speed up. Okay. So generators, I won't say much. It's basically, you, you, typically, it depends, depends on the types of models and so on. So you have a voltage, and then you go through um, a, a series of impedance, then that is a terminal voltage that the network sees. Sometimes we ignore this. Sometimes we will solve this as part of the network. Right? But this is a terminal voltage that defines the voltage source. Okay. So, Putting everything together, suppose we have a system where we have three phase generators with the terminal voltage is some V line. Going through a step out transformer, going through a transmission line, a whole network with a single line, step down transformer, and then eventually an electric vehicle. Right? Then you can write down, because balance operations and everything, you can write down the per phase stuff as we did. Right? Then you, you get oh, three phase transformers three-phase transmission line, uh, step-down transformers, then you get a circuit. Uh, you can do the analysis. So this part models the transformer one, step-up, transmission line, which is, is the simplest model. There's no pi, right? So, so the shunt emittance are ignored. There's a series of impedance that represents transmission <coughs> line. And then you have a step-down transformer, and then you have low. It's a perfect circuit. You can do circuit analysis, and then get what, what you want. Yes? <clears throat> what if you have many loads? Ah, in parallel, for example, yes. Yeah, you, and you, yeah. you uh, are somehow splitting the power among them. Yes. Is it additive? Can we think of conservation with the power of the two? Uh, there, there, there is conservation of power. Yeah. Whether it is additive or not <coughs> depends on multiple things. Depends on, for example, the loads are in series or in parallel. Yeah. Depends on the size of those loads and so on. So you can calculate all of them is, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, half an hour, okay. So, uh, right, so, so now we, we know how we build from these physical systems, we have simple mathematical models, everything boils down to per phase, linear, right, as far as voltage and currents are concerned. You can use that to model a whole network. Multiple loads and so on. multiple generators. And then you can use that to formulate OPF problems, which again, a lot of applications boils down to solving this constraint optimization problem. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about this. Um, 
So here's one example where you have a source. So this is a, it can be a voltage source, but it's an equivalent uh, current source uh, representation. What is the current source? But it's some source. Going through a transformer, a line uh, coming to a low, which can be a current law, constant current law, or whatever law. The point is, you, this is three phase balance. You can write down its per phase circuit, it looks something like this. So the interesting thing is that um, between this terminal, say all this bus, and this terminal, there are a bunch of uh, series impedance and shunt emittance. They may not be equal and all of that. So for example, in this transmission line, uh, we're using the simplest model. There's no shunt emittance, just, just the um, series impedance, <coughs> or one over that, so the y. The y appears here. There's the n here because of this um, regulating transformer. There are some shunt uh, elements in your circuit model that are due to um, the, the trans transformers and so on. Right. So, and therefore, in general, if we have a network where this is a bus, so V1, I1 represents <coughs> this, for example. So on one end of the bus, you apply a V1, you have a current I1, go through a transmission line, um, go to connect to another bus. This can be a load or a generator, whatever, right? So this is a simple network. Then each transmission line, so this is a sort of a ideal, this is not a physical transmission line as we saw here. It, it can have multiple devices. They are, they are modeled by some serious impedance and shunt emittance. And therefore, the, this, this thing that consists of physically maybe a transmission line, the, uh, transformers, and whatever devices can be characterized by three numbers. There's a series <coughs> impedance, or one over that. And then there's a shunt at each end of the line. And they may be different. They're not necessarily the same. This may not be the, this, this, this shunt emittance that characterize this connection may not be just due to the pi model. It can be due to other devices in your network. <coughs> but if you specify your network, you think of this simple model. You have buses joined by, <coughs> we call it links, to differentiate that from transmission line, the actual transmission line, uh, connected by links. And those links can be characterized by three numbers. With, with specific interpretations. Okay. Um, they may not be equal. Okay. Then, with such notation that describes your network, right, so these are given, these are not variables. Once we build a network, in principle, we know what these numbers are. Then, they define a matrix, what's called an emittance matrix, is Y that relates the vector of in, uh, in, uh, currents, I1, I2, I3, and the vector voltages, V1, V2, V3. So the voltages in the entire network is related to the current injection at each bus by this simple relationship. This Y matrix is determined by all those uh, parameters that defines your links. OK, so the point, again, is that it's a linear system that, that, that if I build my network, I know this network matrix. I know the relationship between voltage and current. Okay. So you can write down what, what, is the, what is each element of this <coughs> matrix. You can write this down in terms of those specifications. It's a nice structure, but, uh, but it specifies the graph structure and the, and the impedances and Emittances. Okay, so that's a network matrix. It's going to appear in the OPF property. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, right, so that's the matrix. Um, so let me just go straight down to that. Using that matrix, which, uh, this is, so these are the uh, series impedance or one over that emittance. On each, on each link, right? Again, a link can consist of lines plus transformers and other devices and all that. Um, so this defines a network. Now, uh, what I 
well, well, so so we have looked at this. So this this define this is a network matrix. This is a voltage cur a vector of all voltages in the network at each node. Each node. This is a current injected at each node. The vector. So that y defines the network. Um, the power. So this is linear. If we're interested only in voltage and current. If we're interested in power, because my EV needs 30 kilowatt hour, right, then. Uh, then we need to define what is the, say, the low at node j, which is some complex power. That complex power will be related to the voltage and current at that node by this. Okay, so that's the power balance. And therefore, if we're only interested in voltage and current, everything's linear. But once we're interested in power, then you get this quadratic. So that defines a powerful equation. And we can eliminate i. Eliminate, you eliminate i, you get a relationship between the power injection. You think of this as a generator pow generation, power, <coughs> how much you generate. Or well, think of this as a low, how much you need to consume at node j. Right? You specify this, for example. Then you want to figure out what is the uh, voltages that you need at each node. But you can eliminate i, then it looks something like this. Uh, it looks something. So the power balance becomes this. It relates the power injection at each node with the voltages at each point, every node. Really, the node connected to node J. Right? And that connection is this network matrix. Okay. So, um, so that's complex form. You can write down the polar form. You can write down, in terms of voltage, um, real and reactive, uh, real and imagined power. You can write a quadratic form. Doesn't matter. So, it's, so you get a quadratic form that relates the voltage in the network, in the entire network, and the current uh, and the power. Right. So the challenge typically is that suppose it specify S J for all J. That is, I know exactly how much generate each node, how much consume each node. So I know the complex power every J. What is the resulting voltage? Well, we solve this quadratic equation. Amazingly, very little is known structurally about the solution. Whether it has a solution, whether it's unique, and it's typically non convex and all that. But you can numerically compute. Okay. So the power flow problem is roughly, there are variations, but roughly, you specify this and you, you try to figure out the voltage. And then you say, does the voltage satisfy the, the, the bounds, for example? So, um, so one very important uh, approximation of, of this model is what's called the DC power flow. It's a linear model where uh, the voltage magnitude, so if you look at this power flow equation, this is the basic power flow equation. There's one equation, you, you, if you want to remember one equation, this is the one. So everything is complex. Uh, the voltage, complex uh, voltage, we assume the magnitude is the same, and therefore the only variable in that voltage is its phase. Okay. Um, the, uh, then if we assume the, the phase, uh, if you assume, you can write, you can, you can write so, so essentially you assume uh, the line is lossless, so you don't have this term. Uh, the, this is a constant fixed voltage. So this is a constant. Uh, if you assume theta j minus theta k is small, then sine is roughly theta j minus theta k. And therefore, the DC power flow is a simple linearization of this with additional assumptions. But you get a linear, uh, linear, linear model between the real power at each node and the phase angle. So this is widely used in, for example, running the markets. We try to determine how much each generator should generate and how to price uh, the electricity at each node. This is the model that's widely used. But it comes from that part. OK, so the last 20 minutes. So now we, OK, so let's recap. So we, we build this network. We can figure out a per phase model for the network. We can write down the network um, 
uh, matrix that describes the network topology, the impedance, and everything. Right. And then we have these powerful equations. So, for example, we want to figure out. Uh, so I mentioned at the beginning that the way we run our system is we forecast demand, so we know the SJs that are demand. We have to decide how much each generator should generate, when and where. So we have to figure out um, a problem, uh, right? So there you can formulate the OPF. So we'll see that. Um, another example, so we have a lot of solar panels that are coming up, all right? So, so uh, the generation solar generator fluctuates, the voltage fluctuates, and it may exceed, the, say, the legal bounds. Um, but you can try to stabilize the voltage by adjust the output of the reactive power output of your so solar panel inverters to try to stabilize the voltage. What is the optimal way to do, to do that? You can formulate that as an OPF. Yeah, another example, you have a bunch of electric vehicles and you know how much energy each one needs, what is the time um, where, when they park, uh, you know the conditions on the network, what is the optimal uh, schedule for the charging of EVs? You can formulate that as an OPF. So lots and lots of the applications boils down to this OPF problem. Uh, and it is solved routinely every hour, every day around the world to determine um, how we operate the network, how we price electricity. There's a huge literature, the first one in 1862. Uh, I mentioned earlier, this is the most <laughs> important uh, model, and it looks something like this. We want to minimize a certain cost, subject to powerful equation. That's the equation we solve with some operational constraint. Depending on the application, the cost function may be different, uh, the operational constraint may be different. But the powerful equation is always there, supposedly. You can simplify, approximate, and all of that, but it's, it's, it's there. Okay. So it looks something like this. <laughs> Again, details are not important. This can be the generation cost when we try to figure out generation. Or this can be uh, user utility when you try to do <coughs> demand response. Uh, subject to powerful equations. So this looks different, but it's the same equation we had before. But in terms of voltages. Right? You want the line flow to uh, lie between a certain limit, because if the line flow is too high, the loss on the lines are too high, the temperature goes up, the line set, it touches the bush, we get a fire. Right? So, so there's some constraints on uh, the line limits. If it is generator, then there's a capacity constraint on how much you can generate. Right. Or if it is low that is specified, then you specify the lower bound goes up a bound. So this becomes a low that's given. Uh, and the voltage limits. You can have other constraints, but roughly, it, it, the structure is that you want to minimize a certain cost subject to two sets of constraints. One is a powerful equation. That's fundamental. You cannot, we cannot escape. The others are operational constraints, which often are simple. <coughs> That's the structure. And the challenge is that this matrix is not positive semi-definite, and therefore you get this non-convexity. So the variables here are uh, the voltage phaser for all the, every point of the network, the power injection every point of the network, and the line flows. You can eliminate some of them, but okay. Uh, so this is a famous picture that looks like, looks uh, that even if a simple three bus network, the feasible set can be very strange. It's actually arguable, we just said the uh, workshop. Is OPF hard? <laughs> is MP hard formally? But empirically, uh, you just run local algorithm, you very often you get global solution. So it's, so it's still arguable, is OPF hard, right? Not, not in the complexity theory sense. OK, so how do we deal with non convexity? You can linearize, uh, you can do convexization. And there are different kinds of commercializations. Uh, you can do real-time OPF. Okay, so in the last 15 minutes, I want to get to this point. Okay. 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 All right. Ah. 
relaxations. So a lot of people contributed this. Let me just tell you a little bit, uh, five minutes. So, so the ideas were so it's a non, so this is OPF. When you eliminate the injection, you can write injection in terms of the voltage vector. It, this is a powerful equation. Sj equals this, E is the powerful equation that we saw before. Eliminate Sj, then Sj lies between lower upper bound. Then you get an optimization problem where the variable is only the voltage vector. So it's quadratic in, in the variable. It's non-convex QC, QP. You can do the standard uh, semi-definite relaxation. Think of VVH. So everywhere the voltage variable appears, it appears quadratically as a Renoir matrix, n by n matrix. And therefore, the equivalent problem, you think of that matrix as your variable. And therefore, instead of a quadratic in the variable, you now you have a linear in the variable. But not every n by n matrix is a valid variable. It has to be positive semi-definite, it has to be rem one. So these two problems are equivalent. Given any voltage, that satisfy your constraint. Here is a matrix that satisfies these set of constraints. Given any matrix that satisfy these constraints, there's a unique voltage up to a rotation that satisfies that. So they're equivalent. The non-convexity is here. This is linear. This is convex, so you, you can ignore them. Right, so let's just solve the convex problem without the uh, rank constraint. You get your optimal W. Check whether W turns out to have rank one. If it has a rank one, you get a global solution for the original problem. Otherwise, we are stuck. Uh, what's the physical meaning of this rank one constraint in terms of circuit and these phasers? <laughs> uh, not clear. I don't know anyone has any insight. For a specific simple example, that I can tell you. But in general, uh, uh, I, maybe uh, I'm not going to show you a simple example where, where there is a physical interpretation of the constraint. But in general. And therefore, the strategy is that we want to solve this problem, which we don't know how to solve. You can solve the relaxation once you get an optimal solution, which is um, uh, you can check simple conditions. And if you're satisfied, then you can recover. Now, I want to tell you one powerful model. There's actually another major powerful model, which is really interesting, developed at Berkeley uh, by Phyllis Wu and his student, 89. That's really a nice model, has a lot of interesting advantages, but we have time. But for that, you can also do similar thing. It's not the REM1 uh, matrix, but there's a corresponding commercialization. OK, so let me just mention one, th one thing that if this tree network was called a radio network, the tree topology, then uh, instead of solving SDP, which is hard to scale, you can just solve SOCP, second order cone. It's much, much, much faster. So it's much faster computationally but you get the same tightness as SDP. So, uh, so really nice, because most smart grid innovations are probably going to appear in distribution systems. Distribution systems have tree topology, and that has a nice uh, computational structure. Moreover, for tree topology, uh, there are sufficient conditions that guarantee, if you do this second order cone realization, it's guaranteed to give you a global solution for your original non convex problem. There's no, there's no known sufficient conditions for general mesh network. But for tree network, there are sufficient conditions that will guarantee relaxation always works. Now in Perkley, as I mentioned earlier, in Perkley, even if those sufficient conditions are not satisfied, very often we, the, the relaxation does work. Uh, even local algorithm, which is much faster, very often give you the global solution. So there's something, um, in the real network that, um, that seems to have some nice structure, which we don't really understand. OK, so let me skip this. I was going to show you one sufficient condition, but let me skip that. So in the last 10 minutes, uh, let me 
let me tell you about uh, some very interesting work uh, by Yu Jie Tang, who is a current grad student, DJ who was a former postdoc, and, and this really started with uh, a little part of his thesis, PhD thesis, now in uh, Lin Wengang, who is now on Facebook. So the motivation is that, uh, the original motivation was, was interesting. It, it came about um, in our upper E project where uh, we try to understand these realizations and stuff. And then uh, the upper E want us to, don't just use MATLAB, which is too simplistic. Use this group ID, which is a very elaborate piece of software that simulates the network much more realistically. But none of my, so which means that we have to develop uh, solvers and integrate into the group ID code. None of my students want to do it. <laughs> so I said, okay, let, let's just use Squid ID as a, uh, as, as a, a black box. Uh, let's just develop algorithms uh, to optimize on variables that we can actually control. So at the time, we were looking at controlling EVs, inverters, pull pumps, and storage. So let's develop algorithms just operate on those devices that we actually control. And then we apply that control to Squid ID and just read off what it gives out and then just repeat. So, so it really came about, you know, we, we try not to, uh, not to mess with uh, good ideas code. But if you think about this, this is exactly what we can do in real system. This is the only thing we can do. We can run all these offline algorithms, compute all the variables, the voltages, and line flows, and everything until it converges. Once we get a solution for all the optimal variables, there's only a few variables that we can actually set. Right, we set the network, the network is going to solve powerful equations for us and determine all the other variables. Right. So really, what we can do here is all we can do in practice. The second uh, motivation is that, well, the network is com So the computational complex uh, uh, challenges in OPF that we formulate comes from powerful equations. We have to somehow implicitly or, ex or explicitly solve that. The network is always solving powerful equations for us in real time at scale. So maybe we can exploit that. If we can do that, then we will naturally get algorithms that will track network conditions. If the network condition changes, um, it hopefully will be reflected in the measurements that we get from the network. Right. So you would. Uh, so this is, will be important close through. So it's very much a feedback control perspective to this optimized state, OPF. Right. Uh, okay, so, all right. Okay. So let me just describe the, the setup. So the OPF is, we want to minimize a certain cost, depending on your applications, whatever the cost that is, over two set of variables. One corresponds to devices that we actually can control and set whatever the set points. And the other ones are the states of the network that we don't really actually control. So the line flows in the network, the voltages in, at the nodes, for example. Subject to two sets of constraints. One is a powerful equation. One's, uh, the other set is the, the set of operational constraints. So let's assume essentially implicit function theorem holds, which means that if we choose any control, at least in this set, there's a unique solution, y of x, that satisfies this, which the network will compute for us. So that's the assumption. Um, if that's the case, then we can substitute every, where the variable y appears, we can substitute y of x, so that we get a problem that's min, uh, minimizing over only x. So now this can be convex in y, but this becomes non-convex in x. So this is what's a linear constraint in Y, this becomes non-linear constraint. But you have this non-linear, uh, non-complex optimization. What is interesting, there's an interesting result by someone else that says the feasible set is actually, it turns out to be convex. I thought that was really nice. Okay, anyway. So you, you have this non-complex uh, problem that you want to solve. Many ways you can solve this. One is to take this constraint which is uh, difficult put it as a penalty or a barrier. Then you get to a form where you want to minimize over x in a very simple set this complicated cost. This mu is the parameter that defines your penalty or barrier. Right? So suppose this is a problem we want to solve. 
Yes. If I understand what you're doing, uh, it seems that the power is being consumed exactly at the, without any time delay, exactly as it's being generated. Mm -hmm. right. So in reality, you might want to generate at one time, store it, and then use it. So that you can still formulate within the same framework. Then you get variables at each time. Yeah. And there's a, there's a, if you can store, then the storage will couple those variables across time. But you will still be within the same framework. You just have a bigger size. OK. So, so the idea of this uh, real-time or online uh, feedback is that don't solve this problem until it converges and then apply your control. You just, in each time step, you take a gradient step, apply your control, and then you measure the y of t. And therefore, there's no free lunch. We don't have to solve powerful equations. But now we have to do all the measurements and communications and all of that. It's not clear it's easier, but, but that's the trail. But of course, if you, do the, if you can do this, there are other benefits. It's not just avoiding non-convexity. It's really the tracking that's important. In the future, when we have more and more uncertainty, we really need to close the loop. Right? So, 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 so this approach explicitly exploit the network as powerful uh, solver, and you would naturally track. Cool. Let me just close by, let me skip the static part. Let me just tell you the tracking part. Okay. And then we should be done in a few minutes. Uh, OK. Um, OK. So, OK, so that's the static OPF that we just went through. You can go through the stats, eventually you get a nonlinear equation in x only, right? The, suppose the OPF also changes. So each time step, you take a gradient step, you apply it to the network. The network changes, you get a different OPF that depends on t. So it's a time-varying OPF. I mean, there are variations where you can do, instead of one iteration apply, you can do 10 iterations apply. Conceptually, it's the same. And if we think of each time step, you take one gradient step, apply to the network, the network changes, you get the measurement of y of t, you compute the next gradient step, and you repeat. So the question is, as the time-varying OPF progresses, how well does it track? Okay. So, so, right. So, well, first order algorithm doesn't track very well. So, let's do the second order. Right. So this is Hessian or some approximate Hessian. Right. So the same step. Each time t, you take a gradient step, you apply to the network. Network will solve powerful equation. You get your measurement y. That would allow you to compute the gradient step, and then you repeat. Okay. How well does it track? Well, suppose, oh, OK, so this details of how you compute. Suppose at each time t, you get an OPF. Somehow you figure out the optimal solution for that OPF at time t. Is there any local, local optimal or global optimal? Right. This is the xt that you generate using this Second order of the algorithm. You look at the control error, time average. Okay, so that's the, how well you track. Then you can, <laughs> you can show that it, it depends on three things. In retrospect, space, not surprising. It depends on how fast the OPF changes over time. As represented by, for example, how the optimal solution for each time t OPF evolves. If it's static, then you get zero. Uh, this has to do with at time t minus one, you get a you 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 make a you make a gradient step, right? At time t, uh, then the problem changes. Maybe the feasible set changes. The point that was feasible in t minus one is no longer feasible, so you need to do something. So, and so this captures that. It also captures how far is this initial point from the optimal at time t. So again, all these are measures of how fast your OPF changes over time. The second factor depends on the error in your approximation. It's the exact Hessian, you see. Um, and then the condition. So, and therefore, if the 
problem doesn't change fast, if the problem is well conditioned, and if there's no error in your computation, then you test well. So it's not too surprising. OK, so let me just close with uh, this is some simulations. You can see that there are two curves on the cost. One is the optimal cost, one is the how well the algorithm it tracks very well, basically. But of course, there's a lot of, um, a lot of challenges underlying this curve. It's, it's certainly not soft. There's a lot of open, open problems. OK, so let me close with you. Um, so hopefully, in the future, we'll have a large network of distributed energy resources. And at least for some applications, we will need to do real-time decision. And very often, one of the computational challenges is due to the powerful equations, which we cannot escape from. Um, and yet, the network is solving this. And maybe we can exploit it. If, and if we do that, we'll get an algorithm that naturally tracks. Right? So that's important for the, for, for the, for the, for the real-time feedback. Um, so it's, you can do that at slow time scale or do that at fast time scale. OK, thank you very much. Big questions. Um, so how, it's interesting using the network to kind of give you a, you know, a feasible solution for free. How do you combine this with the um, desire to plan ahead at the same time? Right? The right. question about you know using storage for injections and withdrawals to the plan. How do you combine that with right. the, this real time aspect? Right. So we haven't looked at that, it, and it is. Um, I, it's, it may not be the simple question, but one obvious thing you can do is, OK, suppose there's some forecast. Then you can formulate that within the same framework. Right? But then there's all sorts of issues on forecasts and how do you do the forecast, what's the errors, will the error propagate, and all of that. But that would be one obvious thing to try first. But I think this, there's open. I mean, there's a lot of uh, challenges which we don't quite understand in this real time or time bearing OPFE. Would the OPF problem be formulated for the whole <coughs> grid as a single problem? It is here. It, it is for the whole grid. But then the whole grid depends on your application. Yeah. So for example, if I'm interested in, uh, let's say I have a garage on the EV charging, uh, and I want to optimize the charging process. But also with respect, also providing, say, demand response energy services to the grid. Right, so when I do the EV charging, I can optimize the charging process not only for the user benefit of the user, but also I can help, um, say, stabilize the voltage on that feeder, on that part of the network that my garage con connects to that has a lot of solar and if the voltage fluctuates. Now, in that problem, I can formulate an OPF. Then the network would probably just be that one feeder or a small part of the feeder. Now, if I'm thinking about what's called economic dispatch, where you try to decide the generation, then the network at the ever aggregate level will cover maybe the entire California, for example. So the actual network depends on the applications and all that. So last question. So when you talk about the OPF problem, it's a nonlinear optimization, so you converge to a local minimum. But when you introduce dynamics and you're taking real-time measurements, does that help you converse to a better locally optimal or globally optimal solution? Or there is a continuity in locally optimal solution across time, so you always stay within the locally optimal valley, right. and therefore never escape the valley. And right. uh, OK. All, the quick answer is that we don't understand all this subtle issue. Okay. One thing we observe is exactly uh, one of the difficulties that you alluded to, which is you can be tracking a uh, local optimal and then the problem changes, that local optimal disappears. Right. <laughs> yeah. So there's all kinds of interesting issues which we don't really have a good grasp on. But. OK, let's thank Stephen for a beautiful two lectures. Thank you very much. So we'll be back here at